Please be opening your Bibles to the New Testament, Titus chapter 2. We want to read verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. Paul, of course, is writing to the young preacher, Titus. And he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The American Standard Version, 1901, reads, For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. I want to look at some things here, but I want to emphasize the last three words in verse 12, or four words actually, in this present world. Whatever is to be done in the preceding words of these verses is to be done in this present world. Greek word for world means age. The age in which we are living. So as we look at what is said here, we understand that in this present age is the time to prepare to meet our Maker. This destroys the idea, if nothing else did, that there's a second chance following our life here on earth. This is it. This is the time of probation. This is the time to hear the gospel and honestly understand it and respond to it and to live our lives in accordance with it. And now we want to talk about what is set out in these verses as to living the way God would have us live. We recognize that the grace of God is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God that no man can earn. We read from the scriptures in one way or the other, especially the book of Romans, we learn plainly that we cannot in and of ourselves or any other group of people formulate a way that we can be reconciled to God because we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that death is the payment for that sin, Romans 6.23. We are separated from God. We're separated from God, and if we do not, in this present age, understand the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, Believe it and obey it. In the age to come, there is no probationary period. There is no opportunity to change. What we do here in this life or what we don't do settles it forevermore when this life is over. The greatest manifestations of this unmerited favor are actually the life and the death of Jesus Christ in dying for the forgiveness of our sins. In dying so that we could be restored to God. That we would be reconciled to Him. That we could be as if we had never sinned. That's a marvelous thing. Those of us who have heard the gospel understood it from the heart obeyed it, realize how terrible sin is. And that in becoming a Christian, we turned against sin and a life of sin. That we resolved in our hearts at repentance that we would become dead to a life of sin and now alive to a life of God. Thus, we are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Acts 2, 38. What happened? We rose from that watery grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ, not a stain of sin upon us. 
Now, how do we stay in that position? That's what Paul is talking about here. The Bible tells us all we know about God. The works of salvation that Jesus did, of course, that's all on our behalf. And all that He did was what we could not do for ourselves. And then the great gospel message of God's love for us that tells us how to appropriate what Christ did to save us from sin in our own lives. In other words, He tells us how to be saved from sin. But more than that, and this is what's talked about in Titus 2, 11 and 12, how that saved people ought to live in order to show their love for God and their faith in God and His gospel system of salvation. Many times in recent weeks, but over the years, I've pointed out and you've heard and you know that most of the New Testament is written to people who have been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. People that the Lord added to His church, Acts 2.47. It's written to tell us that once your old sins are remitted, now here's the way you live a faithful life. So when we look at the grace of God, notice that it came teaching. When people talk about salvation by grace, most of them don't understand that it teaches us something. And that if we do not heed that teaching and understand it, remember this was written to a young preacher. He's not writing to people outside the church who never heard the gospel. He's writing to what Titus needs to preach and what the people who hear him need to understand. So I want us to emphasize what Paul emphasizes to Titus. The grace of God came teaching. Well, what did it teach? Well, first of all, let's emphasize that the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us what we have renounced. Some people want to be saved by God without renouncing one single solitary thing. But you don't see that in this passage and, of course, many other passages. The word here, denying, denying, in the Greek language is a present tense verb. Now, in the Greek language, present tense means linear action. You just draw a line and it keeps on going. It's not like present tense in the English where we talk about right now, this is in the present. So when he says it's the present tense, he's talking about in this participle, which is an aorist participle. We'll talk about that in a moment. He's talking about something that keeps on going. It starts at the point of our being baptized to Christ for the remission of our sins, and it keeps on going, but it's dependent upon our attitude and what we think and do and say and don't do for that matter. And when it says in the Greek that it's an aorist participle, it would read actually having denied or having renounced. What does that mean? How can it be present tense and aorist? Aorist is punctilar action. Happens right now. Put a period there. Right there. Well, how can you use the two together? A present participle where it starts and just keeps going and never stops. And yet an aorist that says right here it happens. Well, I think for a moment in the plan of salvation. Having heard and understood the word and been persuaded that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 8, 14, or 6, 14. Let us recognize that one comes to a demarcation point. That demarcation point When you die to sin, the practice of sin is at repentance. That's what's involved in repenting of one's sins. Then when do you become a new creature? It's not at belief and it's not at repentance. You become a new creature when you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27, Romans 6.3 and 4.0. 
Now, I remind you, Galatians 3.27 is written to Christians. Romans 6.3 and 4 is written to Christians. They didn't need to be persuaded about the deity of Christ or the plan of salvation. They had heard it and believed it. They had from the heart obeyed it. Paul says as much in verses 17 and 18 in Romans 6. Why then does he say this to them? Because they need to be reminded that in Christ they are new creatures they have renounced certain things that are worldly, that are contrary to the authority of Christ, that are unlike Christ. The Arius tense suggests that the denial is a once for all. Now that tells us something about repentance in the plan of salvation as one becomes a Christian. When a person repents as is talked about and commanded in Acts 17.30 in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The idea is I die to sin once, the practice of sin, purposing to sin, not caring about righteousness. And from here on out, I'm alive to doing God's will and that's all that makes any difference in my life. Now I fully understand I'm to fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole duty of man. That's why it can be present and yet an heiress involved in the Greek language. It happens at one point, but it goes on and it doesn't stop. Once it happens, it goes on. It doesn't stop. People need to understand that if they're to fully obey from the heart that form of doctrine when it comes to repentance. That's why we say so often, it is not just saying I'm sorry, but does it involve it? Of course it does. But it's far, far, far more than just saying, I'm sorry toward God for my sins. It is a resolve of the inward man to no longer sin. And one will set his or her life course on not sinning. So we find John saying in his epistle, little children sin not. Don't sin. Now he tells us what happens if we do from time to time out of weakness and ignorance sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, forgives us of our sins, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But the point we're making here about grace and the favor of God is that it helps us understand that we are to renounce a life of habitually living to suit ourselves and not caring what God said. Now it's been turned completely around. And that's the reason many times repentance has been talked about is an about face. I used to do this. I think I've done it here. Say this aisle, you're walking through life. And from where I stand of the doors back there is the end of life, beginning here and ending back there. Well, I'm going down through here right toward life and down the end of my life. And, of course, I'm not a Christian, so... I learn the truth, I believe it, and I obey it. I said, I'm not going that way anymore. That is, down the wide way, the broad way. Now I just turn around. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to go the way the Bible teaches. That's fundamentally what we're talking about. And that's what the Bible's talking about. So we never, from repentance forward, intend to practice sin any longer. As long as we live. And you'd be surprised, well, hopefully you would, many of you. And when you resolve something like that, when you are determined to do that, when your whole faith in Christ has turned you around and handed you from hell to heaven, how that changes what you do in life. So this, this uh, word, grace, carries with it the idea of renouncing ungodliness. If we have denied ungodliness, then we're not impious people. We're not irreverent. We are not disrespectful toward God or anything that pertains to God. But since this attitude is manifested in general disobedience to God, the word is used for such sins as make us unlike God. Now, what's the significance of this? Who is ungodly? He's a person who's unlike God. If you're ungodly, you're unlike God. Well, how do I know how to be like God? 
Well, that's why you become a Christian. Remember, Christian means of Christ. If you follow the teachings of Christ, you're like God. If you don't, you're not like God. When people refuse to follow the example or the pattern of Christ as set out in the New Testament of Christ, and Jesus was God in the flesh, and they practice things which make them unlike Jesus, all they can be said to be is ungodly. Now next, notice we have renounced worldly lust. Worldly lust. Our English word lust, L-U-S-T, is almost always meant or means an evil desire. Now it doesn't say that desire is in itself necessarily wrong. God made men and women such a way as to desire sexual relations. That's not wrong. God, in fact, said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. You can't do that without sexual relations. But he limited, he, he regulated that and said it's only to be between a husband and wife, such as Matthew 19, 6 states. Now, if your appetite for satisfying your sexual desires takes you beyond the guidelines of God, then that's why it's called lust usually as an evil desire. In other words, what makes any desire evil? When you fulfill it contrary to the teachings of God. But now the word Paul used can mean simply desire. And so he used the word worldly to indicate that the desires we've renounced are evil. That's why we talk about worldliness. It means a life lived contrary to the teachings of Christ. These worldly lusts are the things that spring out of our hearts because we don't regulate our desires with the truth and thus, you have such things spoken of as filthy and foolish conduct or conversation as it is in the King James Version. Or you have evil deeds. So we have then in Proverbs 4.23 something about this where the inspired writer said, Guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So much is said in both the Old and New Testament about thinking on godly things. Thinking on doing good as the Bible defines good. If you let the evil of this world weigh on your mind, it'll get you. The devil knows that better than we do. Because he intends for us to concentrate on the affairs of this world. And let me point this out. Some things in this world are neither wrong nor right within themselves. It's how much we involve ourselves in them. If we involve ourselves into the point of neglecting, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then we've allowed something that within itself is not wrong to take us away from what should come first. A lot of people don't understand that. There's a whole lot of folks who enter into marriage. Well, you know, when you enter into marriage, like the Bible defines it, it ceases to be I and me. And it begins we and us. And thus the thinking of both husband and wife has to do not with just themselves personally and without any thought to the wife, or as the case may be the husband, but you're a unit and you're one and your goal is for the good of the family. But if you're just going to do as you please, then there's going to be trouble and it won't be long coming. <coughs> and if a person is so spoiled and rotten, as we say today, that everything has to be done just exactly their way, from their perspective and their viewpoint, 
there will be problems. So this renunciation of ungodliness and worldly lust is what Paul calls death to sin. Spent some time on that. That is where he employed that in Romans chapter 6. And in that chapter he tells us that when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. Well, what does that mean? Death to sin. Separation from a life of sin. And this means that our relationship to sin was terminated in baptism. And since we've died to sin, then we have the obligation as free moral agents not to let sin reign in our mortal body to obey the lust thereof. So you see the wills involved in willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word in becoming a Christian and to receive with meekness the engrafted word pertaining to godly living. Neither are we to keep on presenting our members as instruments of sin, instruments of unrighteousness. But the idea is that once for all to present our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This is talked about in the book of Romans, same chapter. Again, why do these Christians? Because they needed to be reminded of what they were all about as a Christian. Listen to what he says in verse 13 of Romans 6. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Now the idea is, we're right back to where we're starting. The grace of God came teaching. We're under grace. We're under the favor of God in that we have been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, which sins we died to at the point of repentance. What are we alive to? Living for the Lord. How do I live for the Lord? I follow the teachings of the New Testament concerning what it is to live the Christian life. It can't be in any other way. Paul would say to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 9, and 10, you put off the old man with his deeds and they put on the new man. Well, I don't know about you, but I will to put my clothes on and off. And so he likens that to righteous living. And he says plainly, you have put off the old man with his deeds and they put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now all of this is said to Christians. Obviously if those brethren of the first century needed to be reminded of these things, though they had been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, they're children of God, they're Christians, then we certainly need it today and always will need it to keep us as people will want to say on the straight and narrow, meaning the way to heaven. So God's uh, grace teaches us what we have renounced and we would do well to remember what we've renounced and also then what we're to be doing with our lives in the church but he doesn't stop there the grace of God came teaching sobriety sobriety now this word soberly comes from a Greek word which suggests the exercise of that restraint that governs all passions and desires, enabling the believer to be conformed to the mind of Christ. That's what Vine says in his expository dictionary, the New Testament words. And listen to what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Therefore, in this word, grace teaches us. And grace teaches us that we are to continue to deny ourselves ungodliness and worldly lust. We are to love the things Jesus loved and hate the things he hated. I guess some people don't realize he hated certain things. But you haven't read your Bible much if you don't see that. We're to love not the world, 
neither the things that are in the world. 1 John 2 and verse 15. All these things are fleeting. They are passing. The whole system that we know in the flesh will not exist someday. We're to love God with our whole heart and mind and strength. And then, of course, love our fellow man, our neighbors. The Bible talks about it as ourselves. If we love God, we will obey Him. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. If we love our neighbor, we will do him no ill. But we will serve him. Again, if you look at the book of Romans, latter part of the book, chapter 13, he makes that comment about our attitude, about our disposition, about what we do. In verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You see love in action. And you see Jesus teaching it plainly when he washed the disciples' feet on the night of his betrayal. That he that would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, let him be your servant. So the life of a Christian is to serve, whatever it may be. Well, we don't have the custom of washing feet as it was in those days. But it may be carrying the bedpan to somebody's bed risen. Some people say, well, I just can't stand that kind of stuff. Well, can you stand going to heaven? <laughs> because that's what's involved in doing the most menial, lowly, and distasteful task, if called upon to do it. A lot of things aren't that distasteful. But we're ready unto every good work. Notice what was said of Dorcas after she had died. It wasn't her teaching as word of mouth, though she may have. It was what she had done for the widows and the things she made at a time when everything was pretty much handmade. She was concerned about the plight of others. The benevolent aspects of our Lord's church many times, I think, gets considerably overlooked as to one of the ways that we live for the Lord. Grace also teaches us to live righteously. Well, remember, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. If I'm to live righteously, then I live keeping the commandments of God. When these people back when I was a younger preacher begin to say, oh, you're just a commandment keeper, like you didn't uh, have any understanding at all of the mercy and the grace of God. Well, we notice Paul said to Titus, the grace of God came teaching. And what it came teaching, one of the things was that we're to live righteously. But to live righteously, the only way I know anybody can is to do what God told you to and the way he said it for the reason or reasons he said it, keeping his commandments. Now, can you think of any other way to live righteously before God other than obeying God? So when righteously and godly are here used together, and that's important for they are. The word righteously is reference to our treatment of our fellow man. And the word godly has reference to our treatment of God. That's important to understand. Remember, the first commandment is to love God with all we are and have. The second is likened to it, to love our neighbors ourselves. You can't do one without the other. Paul tells us, be tenderly affectioned one to another. He then says, communicating to the necessities of the saints. Render to no man evil for evil. Be at peace, if possible, with all men. Then he says, let's not judge one another anymore that we may not put a stumbling block in our brother's way and destroy him for whom Christ died. Romans 12, 10 through 18 and Chapter 14, 13. The latter part of that says is concerning indifferent matters. If somebody thinks that this particular thing is an important thing to him and it doesn't violate anything else, but it's important to him, let him alone with it. What difference does it make? You don't want to cast a stumbling block before them. There are weaker brethren in the church. What does weaker brethren mean? They're not as knowledgeable, and thus their faith can't be as strong. 
Well, if they hold something to be important to them, then you don't want to make them stumble at it. This simply says that we're considerate of everybody. It would be foolish to try to read Romans 14 and not have that understanding because he's not talking about weak brethren forever remaining weak. How would you be weak as a weak brother except that your faith, your confidence, and your trust in God is not where it ought to be? Well, how do you make that stronger? Greater knowledge of the Word. Why? Because the Word of God creates faith. And so for a while, there may be people who think certain things because they're not taught. And you've got to work with them and bear with them. And you don't want to cast a stumbling block before them. Now, what's a stumbling block? It's something I would do that would cause that person to sin. And in their ignorance of the Bible that they need to grow in, then they see me doing something that within itself is not wrong but they think that allows them to go do something else that is a violation of God's will. I heard one fellow put it that way. Well, if I, if I do that, is that going to go, cause you to go out and murder somebody? If I do this, is that going to cause you to go rob a bank? Well, that's the idea of a stumbling block, that in the weak person, weak in knowledge of the truth, thus weak in faith, doesn't understand. Well, they expect to grow out of it. That's true. But how do you deal with them while they're such babes in Christ? You take into consideration their needs. We don't find that to be a problem in rearing children. You don't expect of a one-year-old what you do of a ten-year-old. You deal with them as a one-year-old. You don't expect of an infant at a month or so old what you do of a one-year-old. You deal with them as an infant. Think of when you brought your children home from the hospital or wherever you had them. And think of how you dealt with them then from the way you deal with them a couple of years from now or five years from now or the difference in dealing with a five-year-old and a ten-year-old. You recognize that. You make allowances for certain things because they haven't grown up intellectually or physically to do certain things. So it is in the body of Christ, the family of God, and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the grace of God teaches us that living righteously involves consideration of one another in the church. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Then he went ahead to say, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Isn't that amazing? Why do you work here, according to Paul? To have what you need, but also notice he says, to give to those that have need. We've forgotten that. It'd take care of a whole lot of the welfare problem of this nation. If those that didn't work wouldn't eat and those that did work would be mindful of those that couldn't supply. I say couldn't supply for themselves the needs of life. Then he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and all evil speaking put away, be put away from among you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And what does he use as his example? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Then he goes ahead to say, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not fitting. There's a great deal to do as a Christian to be like Christ. There's a great deal to think about and to examine in our lives if we would put these things into practice. Well, what are we, what's our point here? What grace, the favor of God, we don't merit, what it teaches. Because Paul says it came teaching. The last thing is that, or next to the last thing I want to mention is that the grace of God teaches us godliness. I've already touched on this, but godliness is just simply God-likeness. God-likeness. So this word suggests that we be truly pious. I realize sometimes people use the word pious to mean some show off or pretender, but there is a true piousness. And to be reverent in our worship, 
to God and in our communion with God. Psalm 111 in verse 9 still reads, Holy and reverend is His name. And we must recognize that and remember it as we can contrast our lives with the life Christ has laid out in the New Testament. When you think of God's perfect holiness and you come into His presence with the deepest respect, humility, and reverence for Him. If we were called, and I know this would be the case, if we were called before the supreme judge of the land, we would realize that our welfare for several years are in His hands. I think we would show Him the greatest respect possible. And in like manner, we surely should realize that our physical and our spiritual and our eternal welfare, welfare are in the hands of of God. Jesus in particular, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing. Notice that's not for just a number of years on this earth, but those sentences that are meted out of the judgment to all men place a person in a position he'll never leave. That's either glory in heaven or the horrors of eternal torment, all based upon how we live here and all based upon our reception of the teaching of the grace of God or rejecting it. Then the last point is that grace teaches us to look for Jesus. We're taught in Titus 2.13, it's interesting that that's in the same few verses, in the same context as our text we read at the beginning, that we're looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 1, or Titus 2 and verse 13. Now, nobody here, nobody in the world knows the day of the coming of the Lord and the end of all things physical. We don't even know the day that either one of us will leave this world in death. Well, then the only thing we can realize that's good for us is that it behooves us to live righteously, Every day we live. Paul says we've turned unto God to wait for His Son from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 We've all had to go into the waiting room, usually of doctors, but many times somewhere else. And while you're waiting, you're anticipating actually going in to see the doctor or whoever it is we're going to see. We have an appointment. We're anticipating it. It's on our mind. We're there for that reason. We wouldn't be there for any other reason. And so it is in life for the child of God that's faithful to God. We're anticipating the ending of all things here. Our hopes are set in heaven. Our desire is to please Him. But we cannot be said to be waiting until we're ready for His coming if we won't obey Him, if we won't listen to Him, if we don't put Him first. And once we obey the gospel, what then? How do we grow up to be godly? This God-likeness. We're to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. That's the way it works. That's how you wait on the Lord. You do what He said. You follow His teachings. You incorporate them into your life. So I hope all who hear this simple lesson will realize what all is involved in this particular statement. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously or soberly, righteously and godly in this present world or age. Now, the question you need to ask as we close this lesson is simply this. Am I listening and learning from the favor of God that no man deserves and no man can earn? Am I willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word, whether it's in becoming a Christian or living in the church as a faithful child of God? 
Well, you see, it all begins with the resolve of the heart to follow him or to not follow him. So what is our reason? What will be on our minds as we sing the song and think of the meaning of the song as it's offered to encourage anyone who needs to obey the gospel to do it or to a child of God who sinned to repent? These are important matters and they always will be. You can't find anything more important than they are. Oh, there are other important matters, but they're no more important than this. This is trying to get us ready for the time that we leave all that we see around us, all that we can perceive with our five senses. When this world is no longer our home, but we've entered into the long home that we will never leave. Thus, as we bring the lesson to a close, as I do always, we offer you the invitation to obey the gospel or to renew things in your life be faithful as a Christian. If you're subject to the Lord's call, then we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.